Hello, everyone. It's June the 29th, uh, Monday. Uh, we have lost one other West Virginian. It's our 93rd death. It's an 82-year-old man in Greenbrier County. It, uh, from what I understand, it was, it's one of those individuals that was in the church outbreak in Greenbrier County. And, uh, you know, as we were very concerned, and I, I said right off the get-go, we would be really lucky if we got through this situation without losing someone from that church. And uh, I hate it. I hate it really badly. And, uh, and I, you know, I just caution and underline over and over and over with everyone to use the guidelines that we put out there to really, really try very, very hard to stay that social distance away. Every other pew, if you're in church, absolute mask if you're in church and uh and 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 take our heed that if you go out and you're going into a crowded situation or you're going into a building for crying out loud wear a mask i know they're they're uncomfortable and it's a little bit of level of inconvenience but uh when we've got to deal with losing somebody that somebody is a name and it's a family and it's all kinds of friends and loved ones. So please, please, please listen to what we're trying to say. We're trying to keep you as safe as we possibly can. West Virginia, you have done it already over and over and over. You have done the miracle beyond belief, but absolutely we have got to keep our guard up because this thing could turn really bad really quickly. You have now tested almost 10% of our entire population. We are, are at 9% of our whole population in the state of West Virginia. 10% is an incredible threshold to get to, but we want to just keep on testing and testing and testing because the more information we have, the better off we'll be. Now, <clears throat> today is the beginning of the 10th week in our West Virginia Strong with Comeback. We are now going to enter a, an area where we're going to have fairs and festivals and other outdoor activities going on. It's going to be the middle of the summer. Many, many, many people have said this virus, the sun, has a profound positive impact on this virus from the standpoint of eradicating it, you know, quickly and, you know, a matter of minutes from the standpoint of surfaces and things like that. But still, we all know the transmission of this virus is one to another, people to people. So as we do enter week 10 of this comeback, and we do more things, a 4th of July celebration, an outdoor concert, whatever we do, we have got to try with all in us to do what we should do to keep you safe. If you keep you safe and you absolutely protect you, it'll protect others. And so please do that. Please, please take heed. As far as the monies that are going out in regard to last Friday's uh, announcement of how we were going to handle all of the monies and how the monies have been handled, you know, I, I don't say this from the standpoint of myself. I say this from the standpoint of all those that played an integral role in putting all that together. It is totally a masterpiece is how, how all, the th all the pieces of the puzzle were put together and we're going to be able to run across the finish line on June the 30th with a surplus. Imagine, imagine. And all we have done is we have shifted the deck chairs around and we've done exactly what we should have done. I knew it. I knew it all along and everything. It was hard for me to be able to tell you that really and truly that we never really closed in West Virginia, but we didn't, we didn't. And as far as income streams coming into us economically and everything, many, many, many parts of West Virginia continued to work. Now, 
as we go into the next year, beginning July 1st, sure, we'll have challenges as we go along, but West Virginia, you'll meet it. And the good people in our, in our Department of Revenue and everything, and all those people that are having input from the legislature right on down, all those people and all of us together will make this economic recovery happen in West Virginia, and it will happen in a really positive way. As far as the dollars going out to the cities and counties, we now have, I think, 17 million plus that have been awarded. We have 169 applicants. I think the grand total is about 240, the maximum we can get. But, but in that, I continue to encourage all the cities and the counties that have not applied to apply. And we've got to fit, fit it into buckets now to where it, it passes the litmus test and as far as the regs and, and, and all the stuff from the federal government and everything, but, but truly what I really believe is going to flow to our counties and to our cities is $200 million. Now, it'll be plus or minus that number a little bit, but I think that number will be really close. And those dollars will really, really help our cities and counties in West Virginia. Now, uh, I want to tell you something about a nursing home. You know, over the past few days, we have tested all the staff at our two state veterans homes in Barbersville and Clarksburg. Nobody has tested positive, which is great. And we're continuing this commitment to our, with our veterans all over our state all the time. You know, no question in my mind, we owe everything we have to our veterans and to our active military. And so, and I mean that, I mean that from the bottom of my heart. Everything that we have as far as our freedoms and far as our liberties in West, in West Virginia and all across this great country, we owe to our veterans and we owe to our active military. So we're going to continue to try to look after them as well as all those in nursing homes, all of our people as best we possibly can. Uh, as far as the church outbreaks, we don't have any other new church outbreaks. Uh, uh, we still have three active church outbreaks in Ohio, Greenbrier, and Boone counties. I want to again strongly encourage all those to watch and follow our guidelines in every way. And a lot of our, a lot, a lot of the attendants at our churches are those that are the older people and everything, and naturally, and they're the ones that are, uh, that are at the highest risk. So please just be careful. Let's do a better job at our churches than we've done. And uh, please keep this individual we lost in your thoughts and your prayers, please. As far as free testing today, we're in Lincoln County. Uh, the testing naturally is free for all residents and everything. We're looking for our minor minority communities to come out more and more and more. The more information we have, the better we'll be. I keep saying it and saying it and saying it. And we're going to continue our free testing and we're going to continue to amp up testing all the time. Uh, Okay, the, I, I mentioned our percent of population at 9% now that we've tested. You know, we continue to have the situation with outbreaks coming from the, the Myrtle Beach area. You know, like I said before, we have 100 cases there. We surely, you know, encourage anyone, anyone, you know, that is at Myrtle Beach, to be, that's been at Myrtle Beach to be tested. It's the only way that we can make things better and better protect all of us. Uh, Okay, before I go any further, I, I want to talk to you just a few minutes about our numbers. And I should have let off with this, but uh, I just got a little, you know, going in a different direction here. But, but let's, let's go back to the discrepancy in our numbers. Here's the bottom line. We have now dug deeper and deeper into the situation that what I've said before, we done, the thing that I, where I just went full tilt was we had more active cases reported. I knew it. We had more active cases reported than we had active cases. Now, what does that mean? It means basically that we are over-reporting the sick. It, do, it really is, is a great problem to have found, 
because we're better than what I've been telling you that we are. So what do we do? We go back and we go into a deep dive deal where we're now going back and trying to find every single situation with every, every one of our active cases. Now here's what's happened. And here's where it just won't work with me. That's all there is to it. And I'm gonna only give you the 80,000 foot flyby part and everything, but here's what's happened. We've had a person, let's say Huttonsville. We had people in Huttonsville that were tested and tested positive. At that point in time, they became active. And then as we went forward and everything, and we got people well, and we got past the 14 day period and people had completely recovered and everything, we didn't take them off the list. And we just kept pouring out the list and pouring out the list and pouring out the list. And we've done this in different situations all across our state. Huttonsville is probably the worst. But with all that being said, you know, what we have got to do is, is, is realize just one thing. It is imperative to me that our numbers be right. It is imperative to me that if we don't have a real passion for what we're doing and we're not staying right on top of it, then mistakes happen. That's not acceptable to me. We are probably looking at somewhere close to 300 active cases that could be pulled off this list. Probably it won't be that high. But we have now worked through about half of that. And we're finding too many mistakes. Now it's okay. It's okay for me to sit here and say, you know, that, uh, you know, that everybody's running to the fire and everybody's doing anything and everything we can do. I want our local health departments to hear me and hear me really clearly. You've done one whale of a job. And I am so proud of you, it's unbelievable. If you need additional help to see that timely, timely, these numbers are taken care of, I will absolutely partner with you from now till you know where freeze is over. And without any question whatsoever, if you need additional help, the federal government is pleading with us and saying, we're giving you the money for you to have the additional help. But you and I both know, we have got to have accurate numbers. It is imperative to me to be transparent at all times. And these numbers, although they are totally, 100% numbers that have come in better than what we were telling you, they're still not right. And if they're not right, you know, we owe it to all West Virginians for them to always be right. Now. I am not going to tolerate people that are somewhat asleep at the switch and just sitting there and the numbers keep pumping out, pumping out, pumping out wrongly. So we're on it and we're going to true this up and the numbers today are not trued up completely, but the numbers in the next couple of days will be totally trued up and, and we'll move forward. Uh, I want to announce to you our, our summer feeding program. Uh, you know, over 7,200 people have used this map so far. Can you imagine that? I mean, can you really imagine that uh, 7,200 people within our state have gone to this map for assistance because they need food? So many of us just go through life and are not concerned and everything because we don't have to cope with this kind of problem. But uh, there's 690 sites up there. There's a number 211 if you really are uncertain as to how to get assistance and everything, call. We're going to try to absolutely stomp out this hunger and this situation in West Virginia for once and for all. On a jail update, we have two, two, not 120, two active cases in the state of West Virginia in our correctional facilities today, and they're, both cases are at Huttonsville. We have two cases. 
We've done a really neat, neat job as far as the corrections people, as far as the National Guard, as far as DHHR, as far as the health and everything else. We have done a lousy job in reporting our numbers. I want to remind you again about the census. Get with it there. Get yourself counted. We got to absolutely have everybody counted. It's the only way in the world we can bring in a bunch of extra federal dollars to, to West Virginia. Now, I just got off a call just a second ago with the vice president. On every Monday, the vice president, and lots of, about 50% of the time the president's on, he wasn't on today, but the vice president was on, and, we were, and they were talking about, they were talking about an, a, a secondary-type outbreak that's going on in the country. Now, the primary theme of the outbreak is just this. This level of outbreak is now, and naturally so, because we have a lot of younger people that have gone to beaches and all this kind of stuff and, and, and everything, and maybe we can attribute it all to that. But this outbreak is affecting now those of a couple of generations, or a couple of decades, rather, under the outbreak levels that we were witnessing before. And so this outbreak now is attacking our younger people as well. And for our younger people, everyone should know just this, because this was the underlying theme of the talk that was going on today. Young people are dying with this. And absolutely, it is becoming very troublesome to all those that a, a percentage of the younger people that didn't seem to have a whole lot of problems with this before are now having a problem with it. Now, this doesn't mean that, that a giant high percentage of the younger people are dying or, or terribly sick with this, but what I'm saying to you before, we thought if you were under the age of 50 and you got this, no big problem. Well, that's not the case. That's not the case. If you're under the age of 50 and you get this, it can be a problem. In most situations, it's not a problem. But in situations now that are cropping up, people, some people, are getting really sick. And they are, they're struggling trying to identify the link of, you know, a perfectly healthy 40-year-old on one hand gets it and it's no problem at all. And a perfectly healthy 40-year-old on another hand gets it and it becomes a life and death issue. And they're struggling with trying to figure out what the link is that is causing that to happen. So absolutely, I want you to understand, younger people, please understand, this is not a nothing thing. This is absolutely serious stuff. And, and so absolutely protect yourself and we, we, we know that it will not affect you like a person that is 70 or 80 years old. However, however, we also know that it is affecting young, younger people and in some cases very, very harshly. Also, in addition to that, you know, they also told us that the, the drug uh, remdesivir, I think I, I'm pronounce, pronouncing that correctly, at least I hope, and everything, they, there, there are now large supplies of the drug, and they are, uh, you know, and, and, and from Gilead and through, through this September, they'll be, they'll be pumping more and more and more of that drug to the states and everything to be able to, to treat us, and, uh, you know, if we, if we were to happen to have an outbreak. Uh, the... I guess if I could go back just a second to the younger people. And for all those, you know, I mean, I know the sun's shining. There's probably not terribly a, a great big population of young people that are probably watching this right now. But if you are, or if you're the parents or grandparents of those people, tell them. Just because they get it and they may not have a problem with it, it doesn't mean they can't bring it home. And if they bring it home and mom and dad gets it, it may be a real problem. Grandma and grandpa gets it, could be a tremendous problem. Could even be a problem to them. So we just got to be careful. Now, imagine this. Just on the call just a few minutes ago, 
they were saying to the Texas governor, they said, Governor, just a matter of two or three weeks ago, Governor, your percent of positive dropped into the 4% level. Remember that number. And Governor, we were really, really proud of what you were doing because you were in the 4% level. And all of a sudden, Texas just opened up all kinds of things, and before you know it, this thing whipped, flashed around and bit them. And today, their percent of positive level is 14%. In the state of Florida today, it's 15.5%. Our percent of positive right at this moment is 1.7%. It can change. It can really change. Remember, West Virginia, you're the oldest, you're the most vulnerable, you're the most, you have the most critical illnesses. West Virginia, you are sitting right in prime time. Do you realize in the state of Florida, in the state of Texas, how much of those states are surrounded by water? Well, this thing's not coming to those states by tuna fish. This is coming to those states by people. And in the state of West Virginia, we are surrounded all the way around by people. All, we don't have a, an ocean that is, is cutting off a whole bunch of the access to us. We are completely surrounded by people. We're the oldest, the most ill, the most vulnerable, and we're in dead level the right place to have a real problem. And you, West Virginia, have done it, 1.7%. It's amazing. Keep up the great work. Please, please continue to protect yourself and absolutely wear mask, wear mask, wear mask. Thank you. All right, thank you, Governor. Let's first go to Major General Hoyer with the West Virginia National Guard. Good afternoon, Just a quick update on flood recovery. Uh, National Guard continues to work under the governor's state of emergency declaration to provide support in Fayette, Greenbrier, and Monroe County. BOAD and a number of volunteer groups led by American Red Cross, American Men's Baptist, Team Rubicon, and Mennonite Disaster Services are working with families in those counties to continue to uh, address their needs. Uh, also related to BOAD, they continue to provide PPE to a number of of volunteer organizations and groups and part of our overarching effort. And VOAD has a new uh, email address for those who might need assistance and want to go by email. It's now displayed up on our screen, COVID-19 response at westvirginiavoad.org. Uh, we appreciate the great work all of our volunteer groups are doing. I know the governor greatly appreciates their efforts. Uh, as the governor mentioned, we uh, last week completed testing of the staffs at the West Virginia nursing uh, homes, veterans homes, and we are also continuing to test uh, members of the West Virginia National Guard. Uh, we have had a couple of cases in the last couple of days of positives of asymptomatic uh, individuals. So again, would like to reinforce as the governor does on behalf of the National Guard, and all the folks, uh, healthcare workers, uh, first responders on the front lines, it's important that we continue to get and, and seek testing and that we continue to use our, our PPE in, in public. We believe that uh, because these individuals were wearing their PPE appropriately, that we've, we limit the spread within our force and we must maintain a healthy West Virginia National Guard going forward. Uh, last thing I would leave you with is uh, there is a mobile food bank going on today in Preston County that we're providing support to. Uh, we've heard that there's been exceptionally good response uh, at that event today. Thank you. All right. Thank you, General. Next to Dr. Clay Marsh, our coronavirus czar. Well, good afternoon. I want to uh, reinforce several things that have been said previously we um, have experienced in the United States an all-time record high three days of last week for the number of positive coronavirus people. Uh, the governor mentioned that 
the UV light from the sun is injurious to the virus, but we also know that that's not ultimately the only thing that we need to worry about as states like Florida, Texas, Arizona, South Carolina, Georgia are seeing all-time records num record number of cases. In the U.S., as we've said before, we represent 4% of the population of the world, but we represent about 25% of the COVID positive people in the world and about 20% of the deaths in the world. Um, as the governor also mentioned, we are seeing a change in the people that are testing positive as opposed to what we saw early in the pandemic when we have more limited testing and we had more limited spread in this country. We know today that 70% of people that are testing positive for COVID are less than 60 years old. In fact, the average age in the U.S. today is 48 years old. In, in states like Florida and Texas and South Carolina, we're seeing the average age in the 20 to 40 year olds. So young people are not immune from this disease. And we also know that there are several risk factors for having problems from COVID. And many states, including Arizona, Texas, Florida, are start, starting to run short of ICU beds. So people are getting sick and coming to the hospitals. This is what we desperately want to avoid in West Virginia. And the governor's mentioned we've done very well, but we also know from the National Governors Association that states that have much more mask wearing seem to see a reduction in the number of COVID positive people versus the states that see much less mask wearing are seeing increases in the number of COVID positive individuals. So for West Virginia, we have done really well but it is absolutely crucial that we double down and wear our masks, protect ourselves when we go out, maintain physical distance, avoid the three C's, which are indoor places, uh, closed spaces, our constant contact with people that you don't live with. That's 15 minutes or more of exposure, uh, three feet or less from somebody who you don't live with. And as we said, maintaining a six foot distance is even better and also avoid crowds. And as we go forward, we are seeing more activity in West Virginia, just like every other state is. But so far, we have been able to mitigate that because of the actions of a number of our citizens. But it's time now to recruit even more people to make sure that we're protecting ourselves. If 80% of our population wear masks, and masks, as we said, protect you from spreading to others, but it also has, it seems it has a small benefit of others to you. If we can get 80% of people to wear masks, then we will hit, we will reduce that R naught or RT value to where we will when we get a vaccine. So West Virginia, you've been great so far. Keep it up, be the model and help us protect our state, open up our vital resources so that we can all enjoy them safely and with help. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Marsh. Secretary Bill Crouch from the West Virginia DHHR is also joining us today and is available for questions. Now we'll go to questions from our media members. The first questioner today is Charles Young with WV News. Hi, this is Charles Young with WV News. Uh, Governor, obviously I understand the importance of getting an accurate count of the number of our active cases. Could you tell us what impact this discrepancy has had? For instance, have we you know, sent resources to places they didn't need to go or prioritize testing in a place where it didn't necessarily need to happen as of yet? What, what has been the impact of this discrepancy in the data? Charles, we're still, uh we're still evaluating the numbers and and to give you an absolute answer on that i can't really give you that at this point in time however however i can tell you this i don't think that it has had an impact from the standpoint of us directing resources where it has an impact is this charles it has an impact on the fact of, of just this if i come out and i tell our people you know that we've got we still we've got a problem and and i did this the other day and and the number of our active cases have jumped up significantly and and basically i'm telling our people 
beware, 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 and, and everything, but I'm doing it at a heightened level when maybe really and truly the numbers were wrong. In fact, the numbers were wrong and everything. The numbers that I was giving, given were wrong. And, and so therefore, you know, I am, I am alarming our people unnecessarily at that point in time. The other thing is just this, you know, is, is while we have been the beacon of the nation, those wrong numbers are inputted directly to the federal government and, and, and really and truly then we're showing up on every news broadcast and everything else that our numbers are jumping off the chart. Well, that's not good for us either. And the one thing that you have got to have in me is trust. Trust that I absolutely, when I tell you something, it will be correct. And if I'm telling you numbers in, 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 that are incorrect, you lose confidence. And I don't want that in any way. You see, I want to be transparent at all times. I do not think that we have, we have, let me give you a perfect example. In Randolph County in Huttonsville, we had a situation there. And then we tested all the residents in Randolph County that wanted to come out for testing and everything. And we put resources there to do that. I think it was smart money and everything, a good move. I don't think we have spent any money unnecessarily on stuff, but I can't tell you it all yet because we, don't, we still have some more work to be done. All right, thank you, Charles. Next, we'll go to Phil Cabler with the Charleston Gazette Mail. Hi, Governor. Um, can you explain why uh, the uh, accounting uh, error or erroneous accounting of these uh, active cases is worthy of termination, but the uh, misspending of a half million dollars on counterfeit N95 mask has not even warranted an investigation up to this point? Well, Phil, I, 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 I can't tell you that uh, I, I think you're overstating the, uh, the $500,000 on counterfeit, because I think Secretary Sandy has, has uh, addressed that over and over, you know, and, but, but in this situation, you know, what has happened here is just this. There is just a culmination of a lot of different things that prompted me to act in the way that I acted. You know, from the standpoint of saying, well, you know, people have not made mistakes. I mean, I've made mistakes along the way. But the culmination of things, you've got to have real confidence in what you're doing and what the people around you are doing and everything, and that's why I made the decisions I made. All right, thank you, Phil. Next, we'll go to Mark Curtis with Nextstar Media. Uh, good afternoon, Governor and, and uh, cabinet members. Uh, I know you've been asked this before in previous briefings, Governor, but I think it has to be asked again to see if you've changed your position or if there might be an altering of position here, because... We have seen spikes everywhere. We're seeing something of a spike here. We're coming up on the 4th of July weekend, and we're seeing some public officials around the country saying it's time to mandate masks, whether it's in Texas or in individual communities like Los Angeles. Are you giving any thought, and, and I'd like to have Dr. Marsh weigh on this too, are you giving any thought to rethinking the policy and perhaps mandating masks? Maybe it's just certain events like a 4th of July parade or something like that. Mark, I, I hope you can see me, but, uh, you know, I make notes to myself during the briefing and, you know, and, and I, I, there's no point in zeroing in on it because I said, I wrote here, please help me. And I mean, what I mean by that is West Virginia, you know, please help me not have to mandate the wearing of masks, you know. I know that it will divide us some, and, and, but I, I am absolutely continuing to uh, be concerned and continuing to wonder if that is what it's going to take to get us to do better. You know, I would ask the people of West Virginia to please, again, help me with this. You know, I am concerned. I am always concerned. Our numbers are great. And, 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 you know, and, and, and I'm concerned about the 4th of July, just like I was concerned about Memorial Day. And, uh, and it's surely still on the table, Mark. It, it has not left the table. And, uh, and, and you know, we'll, uh, 
we'll continue to study it and, and, and consult with everybody, and it may very well be that that's what comes to pass. All right, thank you, Mark. Next, we'll go to Anthony Isaguire with the AP. Governor, what did Kathy Slump have to do with what counties were reporting to the state health department? Did you force a resignation because she wanted to slow down the reopening plan? If not, could you give real examples on things that led to her being forced out? Anthony, first and foremost, that's not fair. That's not fair to do. You know, Kathy Slimp, uh, as far as I know, you know, I was a good person and is a good person. And, uh, and but, but the, the bottom line to the whole thing is somebody's got to be responsible. And there is a multitude of things that surely led to my lack of confidence. And it is, a, it, it is primarily driven from a lot, a lot of different people that were working and interacting with her and everything. And, and, and there, was just, there was just lots and lots and lots of issues. Dr. Slim, I mean, from the bottom, from, from my standpoint, all of a sudden, when we changed from a routine West Virginia, you know, in handling all the situations that you handle from a standpoint of the public health and everything, you know, all the stuff that is handled for, within her department and all that stuff, if you, if you go from routine to pandemic, then you've got to have people that are willing to act and willing to move and lots and lots of different things. There's lots of issues that have happened here, but, but just think about just one thing, Anthony, and just this. And just think about this. You know, what if you, you know, ask yourself just this question. Are you on your job? Are you on your game? If just in Randolph County, just in Randolph County, the health department doesn't report the active cases being taken off. And yet, every day the numbers are coming to you. Every day. And you're the head of the whole deal. You know, now, they're coming to you. And every day, you're just letting them go. And you're just letting them go and letting them go. Are you on your game? I don't think so. All right, thank you, Anthony. Next, we'll go to Kenny Bass with WCHS and Fox 11. Thank you. This is Kenny Bass with Channel 8 and Fox 11. Governor, I don't know if you're aware, we did a, um, an investigative piece on what happened at elder care in West Virginia. I know you're aware of the, of the investigation because we interviewed you, but I don't know if you saw the results of our investigation. But, but the results of the investigation said there was a breakdown in communication in your administration about people testing positive there and then not testing every resident. And of course, we've had uh, 103 people test positive there, 15 people died. Uh, Dr. Slimp was a part of that lack of communication. Uh, also, Secretary Crouch was a part of the lack of that communication. We had discussions with Secretary Crouch about his participation in that situation, or if Secretary Crouch can answer for himself, if he feels like that he handled that in the best way, and if he followed your recommendations and orders to have people tested at nursing homes. Well, Kenny, let, you know, I can't speak for, for Secretary Krause, but, but we have had discussions in regard to this. Uh, the, the whole thing from my standpoint is just really, really simple. And that is we, you know, in the first instant, incident in Morgantown, you know, I said, go test everybody there. And the next one is Wayne County, I think, and I said, go test everybody there. In the situation in Jackson County, we're still investigating, and there was surely problems there that we could have done better at. And, and from that standpoint, uh, you know, I, I came right out and said, I'm not happy about this. I'm not happy. And so... So uh, we lost 15 people there. If in fact we could have done better, if we could have saved one life, life there, what's that worth? For crying out loud, it's worth everything. And so at the end of the day, uh, you know, there's no point in, in continuing to debate my decision or my lack of confidence in Dr. Slimp there's no point in continuing to debate other things. We'll get to the bottom of each and everything, but the bottom line to the whole thing is 
all of us, all of us are subject to make mistakes, but at the same time, all of us have got to realize that this is life and death, and we have absolutely got to do always better, always better. And you know, and, 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 and I'll give you another perfect example. If we are, in fact, not taking people off of the active cases and we're not following up on that, then what else are we not doing wrong? I mean, what else are we not doing? And, and that's what I'm saying. You know, it is easy for me to, to stand behind and, and have the, the strongest loyalties you can possibly have. But for crying out loud, we're dealing with West Virginia's West Virginians' lives. And if we're dealing with their lives, we can't make mistakes. And we can't just sit by nonchalantly and say, well, okay, well, it's not okay with me. And so, you know, we're still, uh, Kenny, we're still continuing to, to look and, uh, and get into this, but at the, at the same time, you know, uh, you know that, that situation was, uh, could have been better, that's for sure. All right, thank you, Kenny. Next, we'll go to Steve Adams with Ogden Newspapers. Yeah, Steve Adams of Ogden Newspapers here. I, I know we keep uh, kind of asking questions in regards to the resignation of Kathy, Dr. Kathy Slemp, but I also have to ask, I'm under the impression that you all, that your administration also wasn't terribly happy with her comments last Monday in regards to uh, talking about how uh, the percentage of tests, which were up last week, they're still up, but they're not as up this week as, uh, or last 14 days as they were previously. I'm under the impression that you all weren't happy with her comments where she said that uh, that doesn't explain the rise in the, uh, in the increased cases that we're seeing, which are now uh, definitely spiking in the state. Uh, what are your comments in regards to that? Thank you. Stephen, I, not to just not answer your question, but, uh, you know, I, I don't see that there was truth to that. And, and, and you know, and, and I, I just, uh, there's too much of that. There was too, too much of exactly what you're referring to. But anyway, but, uh, I think we go forward. All right, thank you, Steve. Next, we'll go to Dave Mistich with West Virginia Public Broadcasting. Hi, Governor. Uh, Dave Mistich, Public Broadcasting. Um, my question is about, you know, this, this budget fix plan that you uh, outlined last week. Um, I'm curious, one, if you could tell us a little bit about the opinion that came from the outside uh, council. Um, it, and, and could we have a copy of that? And secondly, why was the attorney general's office not used for that opinion? And, and third, uh, how, how that opinion jives with, uh, I believe it's Article 10, Section 3 of the state constitution, uh, which starts with the first two words of no money. Okay, it's David, is that correct? Okay, all right, David, here's, here's the thing. You know, on any legal opinions, I go through my, my counsel, and that's Brian Abraham. And, and, and Brian Abraham is working with the AG's office. He's working with these outside councils and all that kind of stuff. So we get, when, when the outside councils or the AG or whomever it may be, reports back to me, you know, cert, you know that, that this is the parameters, this is what you got to go with, that's what I follow. I follow nonstop his lead as far as the le legality issues in its entirety. Now... From the standpoint of, of the dollars in the, co, in, in, in the uh, CARES a, area, those dollars, again, and we have, we have vetted it and everything else, we feel rock solid. Those are for emergency situations, and those are the dollars that I should administer and come up with a plan on. I would, I would tell anybody this, you know, if, if we wanted to come up with 700 other plans and everything, you know, that would be fine. That would be absolutely fine with me. In fact, it'd been a lot easier and everything. But I'd challenge you just this. You find one plan that's better than the plan we came up with. The plan we came up with is rock, rock, rock solid. 
All right, thank you, Dave. Uh, Governor, I'll, I'll turn it back to you. Uh, well, the only real thing I have is just this. Is first of all, I want us to uh, remember in our thoughts and prayers a man that had been, uh, been Bluefield's longest-serving mayor, William Paul Cole, Jr., and, uh, and he's just passed away, and, and let us all please remember him and, and all the greatness that he did and everything for a wonderful community that uh, has thrived right there in, 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 in southern West Virginia for a long, long time and, and produced lots and lots and lots of goodness. So uh, help us all remember him. And the other thing I'll end with is, is you know, we've got some really challenging times, don't we, West Virginia? We've got to some way be able to survive the economics and the economic downturn and the problems that we may encounter from the standpoint of a state, a city, a county, individuals, businesses, small, big, whatever it may be. We've got to figure out how we're going to navigate through all the wickets and survive economically. And we have a plan. We have a real plan. A plan that's not some pet project somewhere. It's a plan that was for all of West Virginia. Small businesses, counties, cities, all kind, roads, all kinds of different things. Public service, lots and lots of different things. And then in addition to that, we have all these grants that we have pumped out to our legislatures, to our pumped out to everybody for feedback in ways that we can utilize those grants in different ways. From the standpoint of West Virginia's year that we're in right now, find me a government, find me a state that has been able to go through this pandemic and say at the end of the year, we've got a surplus. You're not going to be able to find many. I'll promise you that. So at the end of the day, economically, we continue to struggle and we, we continue to fight the fight, but we're winning that fight. Now, on the other side, we fight a fight with health, and we fight a fight that we've lost, lost 93 great West Virginians. And we know, we know that we could awaken to a, from a situation that we're going to have our fairs and our festivals and maybe a 4th of July, or 4th of July you know, celebrations, and we know, we know this thing could whiplash around on us and cause a terrible, terrible problem. We know that we, maybe we should make it mandatory today that we wear masks in buildings. Maybe we're doing the right thing. There is no playbook. There is no playbook as to exactly what to do here. We're just doing the very best that we possibly can in keeping you completely aware of every move on the chessboard we make and everything so far has worked pretty good. It's worked pretty good, not because of Jim Justice and not because of all the people, the experts that are around him. It's worked pretty good because of you, West Virginia. You've listened. You've stayed together. You've stayed as West Virginia strong. It seems so simple. Lots of people use those words, and they really probably don't mean a whole lot by them, by them but I do because I know what you've done. You have stayed together, and we don't need to splinter now because it will cause us lots and lots of problems. I just got through writing a personal note to President Trump. And the note was directly from my heart to a real friend. And a friend that I can see is struggling in every direction known to man. He's struggling with racial unrest. He's struggling with economics. He's struggling with outbreaks in this terrible pandemic. And he's struggling all over the place with lots and lots of different things. And a lot of people are throwing rocks and everything. And I offered up my suggestions of what we've done. We've done right here in West Virginia. We want everyone to know that as far as their ability and right to protest or whatever like that, we welcome it. We welcome the fact that we need to get better and we want to get better. Whether we're on the side of, you know, whether it be the law enforcement side or the other side, we, we need to get better. We need to do more training. 
We need to absolutely always strive to get better. But look how we've handled it in West Virginia. We've handled it in a peaceful and good way, in the way that it should be handled. And it won't be swept under the rug. Absolutely, I promise you that I will strive any way and every way I can to make things and opportunities better. Better for all West Virginians. And absolutely, so when it really boils right down to it, there's lots on our plate, isn't there? There's the economics and the scare of this ter terrible dreaded disease. And there's a racial divide and a racial unrest in this nation and absolutely, we need to address and be concerned to bring us all back together. West Virginians, you have stayed together. You have absolutely been the miracle by staying together. Continue to help one another. No matter what in the world ha it would ever happen to me, if I go out here and get run over in the street today, absolutely all I could possibly do is tell you just this, West Virginia, thus far, in times that were super tough, super tough, you have stayed together. You have absolutely had the leadership and the experts and everything to everybody has worked together to make this miracle a reality. You just got to keep it up, West Virginia. There will be a vaccine. There will be other challenges as we go forward, but there will be a vaccine in regard to this, and it will come, I hope and pray, sooner than later. As it comes, this will fade away. More challenges will come to you, West Virginia. Be the diamond in the rough that everybody's missed. Thank you so much.